everyone. Okay, so we are going to start the third uh, installment, part three of the Genus Homo PowerPoint. Um, so hopefully you've watched the first two. There was part one. Um, I think in that one we discussed uh, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Then in part two it was Heidelbergensis and Neanderthal. And now we're going to move on to the last part. We're going to be talking about uh, Homo sapiens, so our species. So we're still in that same PowerPoint. Remember that PowerPoint's quite large. That's why I split it up into three different uh, lectures. So we're starting on slide 40, 41, sorry. Slide 41 is uh, Homo sapiens. Um, so you'll see here the first slide um, at the very top. It says human slash Homo sapien. And then there's that picture um, from the side view. You can see the skull. Uh, the skull. Um, so hopefully, if you can remember in your mind, and also I'll have some pictures coming up, but also it reference back to earlier in this PowerPoint, that the difference between the skulls of Homo sapiens versus the others in the same genus. So whether it's Erectus or Neanderthal, um, Heidelbergensis, there are plenty of similarities, but there are some major differences. So even if you're looking at just this picture right now, you might recall that for the other species, those in our genus but not Homo sapiens, like Neanderthals, Homo erectus, etc., um, that they have a large brain, but remember that their the shape of their skull is like long and low or like the football shape. And if you're looking at this picture on slide 41, you'll see that we have more of a, a slightly rounded or what we call globular um, shape to the to the skull. Okay, so so some uh, some uh, breakdown of some of the important information about our species. So uh, on average, a fairly large brain, 1,400 cc's. Um, so recall though from from part two that Neanderthals do have the largest brain of any uh, hominin species. Um, but humans, fairly, fairly large, uh, second largest. And for Homo sapiens, our, our EQ is higher, so recall that concept. Um, the next point I already talked about that we have more of a rounded cranium. So there's actually like, there, this is the, a major question in a lot of research, like why, what, like why do we have this different shape to our head? We have a big brain, the Anatols had a big brain, but why, why are we kind of this weird deviation from that? We have this very, interesting derived feature or this newer feature. So it, it, there's been a lot of research looking at too, like is this like biomechanically uh, adaptive in some way? Does it have to do with the muscle attachments? Um, and we really don't have a clear answer except, I mean, some of the research is pointing to it had something maybe to do with the, the, the brain growth in certain areas, but we this is still like a, 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 a point of research that a lot of people are still looking into. So it's interesting, we'll see, you know. Um, so we also have a prominent chin, and in fact, Homo sapiens are the first to actually have what we would consider a chin. So I'm pretty sure if we go to the next slide, let's see, slide 42. Okay, I'll get to the chin in a second, but so slide 42, vertical forehead. So this is a, a, another prominent feature of, of our species, Homo sapiens. So if you look at that side view again, you'll see we actually have like a really flat forehead. And think of like, look at yourself, like I'm looking at myself right now on the camera, like I have a really flat forehead. It's not like with the other species we saw, whether it's those earlier hominins or even the ones in our genus where there's, you know, big brow ridge, maybe a little bit of a forehead, but it's still kind of going back. Even if the brain's big, like Erectus or Heidelbergensis or, or Neanderthal, most of the brain was kind of behind the head. For humans, we're seeing a lot of more on top. And so because of that, we have this really flat frontal bone. This bone right here is called the frontal bone. So we actually have a pretty decent sized vertical forehead. Uh, okay, so this is what I wanted to get to. So slide 43. So humans are the first hominin to have a chin. Now you might be thinking, what do you mean? Like the chin, that's your mandible. They all have a mandible. So what do you mean by first chin? Uh, so look at this picture. I have a comparison between a Homo sapien and a Neanderthal. Um, and look just at that mandible, so that chin portion. You'll see that for, for all other hominins, that part of the mandible where we would call it the chin actually kind of slopes backward or posterior. Homo sapiens are the first uh, hominin species where we see there's actually a slight anterior or forward projection of that part of the mandible. So um, if you can kind of visualize for a lot of these other hominins, they would have, they obviously had a mandible, they had this bone, but a lot of it would just kind of, you know, kind of fade in. Like, you know, we have a prominent feature um, that is derived, it's, it's a newer feature. So there, there's been a lot of really interesting research into this, like why is it biomechanically important for chewing? Like, no. Um, and a lot of the research is pointing to it's probably has something to do with sexual selection for whatever reason. And you could probably imagine this in your own mind, like someone with a feature where the face is more prominent and defined 
is probably a more attractive feature. So, because there's really no purpose for that that bone right there. So, like uh, biomechanically at least. Okay. Um, slide 44. So here we have a comparison between uh, I think it's the Heidelbergensis and the Homo sapien. Um, so I want to point out, and this is like the the one the one bullet point here. I want to point out the um, it's not just like we're we're seeing these general shape differences in the skull between being like a more circular versus a football shape, but also if you're looking at just the front. So here we have this front view. Uh, you can see even the widest part. So in Homo sapiens, the widest part is up here in our parietal bone. Or it's wider up here versus in a lot of the other species, it's more wi wider down here to, on the temporal region. Um, so this is just another interesting thing. Um, so it kind of points to that there's probably something going on with brain growth in certain areas in our species versus the other species, which is why we have, it's shaped differently in like multiple, multiple aspects. Okay, the next slide, slide 45. Okay, human migration. Um, so we talked before about Neander, or, um, Homo erectus being the first to, to leave Africa and, and migrate into different parts of the world. And then after that, of course, we have um, hominins in, in, in different parts of the world and in Africa still and in parts of like modern Europe or uh, the Middle East or into Asia. Um, but it's not until Homo sapiens that we see um, this migration into like what we would consider like now, like in North and South America. So this, this happened... Um, um, I think the dates, uh, actually, before I get to that, I want to go talk about this on this slide real quick. Um, so the, the point of this one slide right here is looking at the, the migration into like parts of Australia and you can see on the picture, um, what the, uh, land mess is now versus what it would have been around, you know, 30,000 years ago when these, these migrations were happening. Um, so you can see like the, there was more land um, there because I think this is always a question like how there's such you know great uh, areas of, of, of ocean between you know island chains or like um, you know continents like how did they how did they get there and while that's still like an interesting question for certain areas because even when we go back in time there's still going to be water there um, that we can kind of see at least it might have been a little easier um, or just just different. Um, but so, so we know that they, um, that these earlier humans obviously, you know, went into different parts of the world via boat probably. So that's interesting. And, um, and then of course getting to what I was saying a second ago, so slide 46. So looking at where um, humans actually, Homo sapiens actually migrated into um, North and South America. So you can see here, once again, this depiction of what the landmass looks like now versus what it would have looked like, you know, 15-ish thousand years ago. Um, a lot easier to walk through but but also keep in mind like this wasn't just like oh we're just walking like there's still like you know glaciers and you know this rugged rough terrain it's still a very difficult uh trek but they they did it and, and very likely um, it was because they were following food so this is an important thing i want to point out whether we're talking about homo sapiens migrating or whether we were talking before about homo erectus migrating <clears throat> or any other um, um species in our genus you know moving into different parts of the world for whatever reason, sometimes there is this very like romanticized version uh, story of, of you know we, we were adventurers. You know, like that's not that's not accurate. In reality, humans just like any other animal are you know have to eat, and um, there's certain foods at this point that we're eating in, in the genus Homo. Some of a lot of it still being plants, but some of it being other animals, and so of course we're following the food, which is why we see these, you know, different species migrating. It wasn't as if they were all somehow like, you know, ad adventurous and, and just wanting to see the world. That's not like kind of get that idea out of your head. <clears throat> we often want to over romanticize the past in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, so for slide 47. So once, once again, I know I said, I, you know, I'm not going to quiz you or put on an exam an exact, um, site but it's just for your reference so here we have some earlier sites um Cro-Magnon in France so you can see this this one of these specimens uh Homo sapien so once again you see that that vertical forehead you see the more round shaped cranium um <clears throat> okay so slide 48 <clears throat> so tools I won't spend a lot of time on tools but just um so you can kind of reference in your mind this this comparison between what we talked about before with Homo habilis and Oldowan tools 
um, Acheulean tools for Homo erectus, we see this big jump in the complexity of the tools because the task that they needed these tools for became more complex. <clears throat> and we just kind of see that progression of that through time. So whether it's Neanderthals or humans, we start to see more complex um, tools, either weapons for, for hunting, uh, tools for um, processing what, you know, different types of food, plant and animal, um, uh, making clothing, things like that. So, so here you can see we have it even smaller for the human Homo sapiens, even smaller, um, more refined, uh, more complex pieces of, of uh, what we call microliths. <clears throat> so um, like we talked about before with the um, Homo erectus, having that mental template, that idea of like a complex design that you hold in your mind and they have to create that. So we're, we're seeing that obviously after, after Homo erectus and these, these other species. Um, so slide 49, um, a little bit more on tools for, for Homo sapiens. There's a really interesting tool and that's what's pictured here. It's called the Adelatl. Um, so imagine you ha can throw a spear. Um, actually, I'll, I'll talk about this for a second before I get into the Adelatl. So <clears throat> an interesting point, I've been thinking about um, humans compared to other apes like chimpanzees. And uh, I don't know if I, if I talked about this in class. I might, I did, because I think we, in class we Googled like uh, uh, bald chimpanzee. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we did. Okay, but so referencing that, we talked about how chimpanzees and, and gorillas and other apes are like extremely strong and humans are not. Um, and so when we really start comparing like humans to other apes, we're like, wow, like what is the benefit of being like Homo sapien? Like why do we have all these really interesting like uh, derived features through, you know, that happen in evolutionary time? Um, to get to where we are now, it seems as if we're like, you know, we're generally weaker, we're slower, like how is this all like an adaptive story, you know? So we talked about with, with bipedalism that actually, while we might be slower in terms of like shorter distances, like if you were to race your dog, like your dog, like, you know, a block, your dog will beat you every time. Like quadrupeds are, ex like any quadruped, is extremely fast in a short distance. Human, like bi bipeds are not. <clears throat> However, long distance, we will outcompete. Bipeds will often beat quadrupeds every time. So like if you, you know, run with your dog after a mile or two, your dog is gonna be really, really tired. And that has to do with the, the position of um, the, the lungs in terms of like the limbs being a quadruped, but also just the, the energy efficiency of being a quadruped versus being a biped, it's so much more energy efficient. And so you can go, you know, you as a biped could, you know, people run marathons all the time, but also you could walk. You could walk, you know, 50 miles and you know, you'd be tired for sure, but you can do that. Um, and you can definitely run, like people run, like my one of my friends is a runner, she runs like, you know, eight miles a day, like no big deal, like that's like minimum for her. Um, but imagine taking your dog out after a mile, that, do you know, your dog is gonna be like pretty, pretty tired. Um, so that has, you know, think of that in terms of like comparing, like with pros and cons, like okay, we as bipeds can't really go fast, um, but we can go uh, long distances really easily, so that's important. Um, but also, but getting back to this, the, the, the weapons. So this is one of the benefits of having our hands free, being bipeds, is that we can throw. Um, so imagine the scenario like you um, have a pr natural predator in like <clears throat> a lion. Would you rather be really strong to where if the lion attacked you, you could you know, fight it off? Or would you rather be, have the ability to maybe throw something at it to get it to run away? Um, so pros and cons to both, but obviously like we have one ability. Um, so we can throw really well, like this, this, the fact that our arms are free up because we're not using it to, for our form of locomotion, but also this like the shape of our scapula and everything is, is, is designed in a way through natural selection to be able to throw things really, really well. Um, if you look at like a modern chimp or gorilla, like obviously they have arms they can throw. You can Google this, like, you know, chimp throwing something. They tend to like we, you know, if you're going to throw a baseball, you would throw it being like that. Um, but they will like kind of like swing their arm like sideways, like when they're throwing, they don't have the ability to throw the same way. So it's like, it's extremely less efficient. Anyway, so getting back to this, so, so as, so as our tools are becoming more and more refined, our ability to use them is like, is definitely more, um, refined as well and more complex. So we have this ability to throw, you know, spears at animals who may be hunting. Um, <clears throat> and this is a difference between humans and, and, and as far as the research is telling us, humans and like Neanderthals. Both of us were hunting, but humans were really good at throwing from a distance, um, probably more so than Neanderthals. And also, and so to, to this picture here, this atlatl, we actually even have a tool that allows us to to fling the spear even uh, farther. 
So it's just really interesting, a lot of interesting tools. And of course, at this point, we're seeing like the, the PowerPoint says, we're seeing like, you know, nets and, and for, for fishing or trapping smaller animals. So we're getting um, pretty sophisticated in a lot of these uh, hunting techniques. Okay, so the next slide, slide 50. So art and religion. So um, around this time where we have Homo sapiens, we still have Neanderthals. Neanderthals are still existing. Um, and we talked about that in the previous PowerPoint that humans, you know, were evolving in Africa. They're encountering, as they're migrating into parts of Europe, they're encountering the Neanderthals. Um, and so they're existing in the same place, place in the world at the same time for, for, for a while. Um, so when we see the art that either Neanderthals or humans were, like those who are contemporary with each other, we're seeing the types of art, they're fairly similar. Um, and you can see here, so we talked about some of the Neanderthal art uh, last week um, on the previous PowerPoint, but if you're looking at this PowerPoint now with the human, you'll see a lot of cave art. And most of you are probably familiar with, with this. Um, you've probably seen these before, like in art class and stuff. Um, but a lot of really interesting, um, really complex and, and very like um, beautiful uh, cave art that we know is associated with early, earlier Homo sapiens. And then I think I just have a few of these. Um, so in the next slide, slide 51, just more picture, depictions of animals, very interesting. Um, and also to point out, I think I pointed this out on slide 50, oh yeah, um, that not always these animals that they're being depicted are animals that they're hunting. Um, so this is always a, a question like, okay, what animals are they depicting? Oh, it's probably the ones that they're eating. But then you start looking at these animals and that, that are being depicted in this art, and then you look at the actual like um, evidence, like at sites of animal bones, you're like, these are not the same animals. So they're drawing animals, and it's not the ones they're eating, why would they be drawing these these animals? And so then, of course, like you start thinking about these interesting cultural implications. Like, was it the animal? Were, was it the animals they just found to be most beautiful? Was it the animals that they found to be more dangerous? Was there some kind of interesting religious significance? Was it just the preference of these this particular group or, or this one artist? Like, you know, we don't know, but it's, it's definitely an interesting you know thought to have. Okay, so slide fifty two. So. The next few slides I'm going to talk about these modern human origin models. Um, the two slides after this one, slide 53 and 54, are really text heavy. So we're going to kind of skip those. I'll just explain it. Um, and I think the slide after that, 55, has a better visual. But okay, anyway, so we're still on slide 52. Um, and there are two main models for looking at modern human origins. Um, so, because this is a question, like, okay, we have, we're looking at these different species, we've been talking about them as a class, evolution through time, you know, migration, but when and how and where exactly do we see Homo sapiens? Um, and like, and then of course, like, how do we understand and conceptualize like the continuation of our species until now? So these are interesting questions. So there are two kind of main models or ways of thinking or schools of thought. Most people, most, most paleoanthropologists will say, oh, I'm a multi-regionalist, or I I'm, I'm adhere to the out of Africa model. And both of these models have kind of changed a little bit over the last maybe decade or two um, with some new interesting research. Um, so we're gonna talk about these two models. And they're similar in some ways, and then of course very different in other ways. So like I said, if you're looking at slide 53 and then slide 54, very text heavy, so kind of just skip past that. That's just for your reference later and go to slide 55. This is a really great visual. Now, of course, I can't like point to it so you can't see, so hopefully you can like follow along with my description of this. Um, this is a really good visual to contrast these two models. <sighs> okay, so you'll see they're labeled. Um, the one on the left is the out of Africa model and then the one on the right is the multi-regional model. So we'll talk about the multi-regional model first. So hopefully you'll see in this picture, it's showing like a timeline um, and then different areas of the world. So you'll see it says like 1.8 million years ago at the bottom until present at the top. Different areas of the world, Asia, Africa, Europe. So if you're starting at the very bottom of the chart on the multi-regional one, it says Homo erectus. So basically what this chart is saying is Homo erectus is existing in Africa. Because if you follow that arrow, you see Homo erectus is in Africa around 1.8 million years ago. And then Homo erectus then leaves Africa and goes into parts of Asia goes into parts of Europe, and also remains, some populations remain in Africa. So if you're kind of following up this chart, you see Homo erectus is existing in these different parts of the world, and those arrows between those lines, basically what that's indicating is, even though 
Homo erectus was living in parts of Asia, parts of Europe, parts of Africa, that there was still enough interbreeding going on between those populations to maintain them as being like one single species, you know, dispersed amongst the world, but not isolated to where they're, be, they're speciating, you know, becoming different species. Multi-regionalists would say, even though they're living in different parts of the world, there's, over time, there's still enough interbreeding going on between these groups that they've remained one species. And then when we get to, um, um, like thinking in terms of like the evolutionary process that these different populations all kind of slowly evolve from Homo erectus into Heidelbergensis into Neanderthal into human. And so it's kind of one, like an end genesis, like one into the next into the next. Um, there's not like these bl branching or splitting cladogenesis events. And they will reference certain morphological features that humans have that we share with, you know, um, erectus that seem, that seem to point to it being um, this this model. However, most paleoanthropologists adhere to what's labeled the out of Africa model. Now this used to be called the complete replacement, sometimes people refer to it now as the partial replacement model, um, but, or out of Africa, it's fine. Um, and most, most paleoanthropologists adhere to this model, they think this is the most correct model, most of the evidence supports this model, especially now the DNA evidence absolutely supports this model. Uh, but you, every once in a while you'll find a multi-regionalist, or at least someone who'll, who'll say, well, I, I out of Africa is prob probably right, but multi-regional model has some, you know, interesting points. Okay, maybe. Anyway, okay, so out of Africa. So if you're looking at this chart at the bottom, you'll see it starts the same. Homo erectus in Africa 1.8 million years ago, and then Homo erectus then leaves and goes into different parts of the world, goes into parts of Asia, some populations stay in Africa, and then some populations go into parts of Europe. So same story at the beginning. Homo erectus is just you know, migrating to different part, parts of the world. Now there are different populations living in different parts of the world. But you'll see here in this chart, there's none of those like um, horizontal um, arrows. So for those who are out of Africa uh, adherents, they would say those populations are separate and distinct. They're not, they're not having this massive amount of interbreeding between them because now they're separate by you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of miles. There's not interbreeding going on um, at all. So keeping with this chart, the out of Africa model chart, you'll see go through time a little bit, and then you'll see something, something interesting happen. Um, so for those who are um, adherents to the out of Africa model, they would say, okay, those populations, like those different populations are, are evolving along their own trajectories. So those groups in um, Asia eventually like die out, the groups in Europe evolve into like um, Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals. So we have Neanderthals in Europe. The ones in um, Africa, especially Northern Africa, we see like um, Homo redigiensis, which we didn't talk about. No, nope, don't worry. Homo Heidelbergensis essentially. Um, and, and then eventually um, Homo sapien. And so what we end up having is this story of Homo sapiens evolving just in Africa. And you'll see that in, in, in this little chart, it's showing Homo sapiens in Africa. And then it shows Homo sapiens then leaving Africa, some staying in Africa, of course, and then some going into parts of Asia, some going into parts of Europe, and that's where they encounter um, the Neanderthals. So in this story, Neanderthals and humans have a common ancestor in Heidelbergensis, um, but not... Uh, but they're, but Neanderthals are not a direct uh, ancestor of Homo sapiens. Um, so sometimes the naming is different. So because I'm, I'm an out of Africa proponent, I would say Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. But multi-regionalists will often say Homo sapiens sapien and Homo sapien neanderthalensis. Like there's a whole different naming system. So if you've ever seen that, just know it's because they adhere to a different model for understanding like where and how specifically Homo sapiens um, evolved and then migrated, uh, that they have a slightly different view way of looking at that. So like I said before, most of the, the research, the evidence points to out of Africa being the correct um, um, model. Pretty sure that's what happened. And the DNA evidence is, the gen genetic stuff is pointing to that as well. Okay. But all that, I kind of explained all that in those previous two slides. That's why they're kind of text heavy. So I'll just tell you right now that, that I will ask a question about this on the, the, the final or the third exam. Um, probably something I'll ask you to pick one and describe it in detail. So just as a fair warning, I know that's like, what are we, like almost a month away, give or take. Um, but just kind of be prepared to maybe um, know this part a little bit um, 
in detail, at least enough to write, you know, a, an essay like before. Okay. So slide, I'll get into some of the fun stuff. Okay, so slide 56, Homo floresiensis. Okay, so I think we've talked about this before, that in science, one of the great things about science is that it always changes with new evidence. Um, and even with paleoanthropology specifically, I showed at the beginning of this, some of these PowerPoints, like this, this you know, timeline, and, and even the more complex timeline, there's still some gaps. And we could say confidently now, like, okay, we probably know like 90% of the story. We pretty much have it figured out. We're still kind of filling in a few things. We're getting new evidence. We're finding new fossils. But we pretty much think we have a, a pretty decent understanding of what, of what has happened in our lineage in the last 6 million years. So, of course, we thought this in, you know, I think this was discovered in like 2005, 2006. So 15 years ago, we thought this too. And then suddenly on the island of Flores in Indonesia, a major discovery that completely shifted what we thought had happened, especially more recently in, in our lineage. We understood, okay, humans, homo sapiens, we are the currently like the only existing hominin. Neanderthals were, were around, you know, around 35, 40,000 years ago. That's when the last of them died out. So before that, there were multiple Neanderthals, humans, you know, um, but for the last, you know, tens of thousands of years, it's just been Homo sapiens. However, we were wrong because we found this um, species Homo floresiensis and a lot of really interesting things about the species. So it's been nicknamed the Hobbit because they're very small. And they existed 18,000 years ago. That is not a long time ago. So as recent as 18,000 years ago, there were at least two different hominid species existing in the world, Homo sapiens and Homo floresiensis. So when we, when we found these, like this is really recent, what did I say, like 15 years ago, really recent. When we found Homo floresiensis, there were a lot of questions, um, especially after finding just the first one. We were like, okay, what's going on? It looks like a home, like it's bipedal, big brain, sort of. It's really tiny, like what's going on? A lot of interesting questions. And this, there was this debate between whether it was um, maybe just a homo sapien who had microcephaly. So microcephaly is um, when like a, a pathological process, like the brain is underdeveloped. This can happen because of a wide variety of, of medical issues. Um, <clears throat> but what you end up having is someone who who would look like a homo sapien, but their head is, and brain is smaller. Um, or there was the question of, is it island dwarfing? So if you go to the next slide, you'll see slide 57, um, a little bit of a description of island dwarfing. So we see this in nature. On islands, islands are a really interesting uh, ecological system. A lot of interesting things happen on islands. Mammals tend to get smaller. So normally if we were in class, I would ask you like, why would it be adaptive to be smaller? Um, usually someone has the answer. They would say, well, you have to consume less, um, less, fewer calories, fewer resources. This is true. If you, you know, if you live on an island with a finite amount of resources and you have to only consume to, to thrive and be successful, maybe 1500 calories, but someone else has to consume like 2200 calories a day, it's going to be beneficial to probably be smaller. So we actually actually see this with with many uh, primate species. Or I'm sorry, mammal species. Them getting smaller on islands, and in contrast, what we end up seeing with like other like insects is we see them getting larger because like their natural predators are smaller. So it's really interesting. So look into this if you're if you're um, curious about it. It's actually a really good topic for the research paper. Anyway, um, so then there was so there was this debate like is it microcephaly because of you know some um, pathological process was it island dwarfing and then we started finding more you know specimens and then it became clear that that's it was actually you know island dwarfing. In fact, so the next slide, slide fifty eight, a really great book if you wanted a book recommendation. I read this book and I read it when I was um, an undergrad, so it's not like it's not super comp complex or difficult to understand. Like I read it when I was just kind of getting into this field. It's a really good book and it goes into um, a discussion on Raymond Dart and um, the tong specimen, which we talked about before, and it goes into this, the Homo floresiensis find. So you can see here in this picture, because there were these questions like, okay, are we, is it microcephaly? Is it island dwarfing? If it's island dwarfing, that's interesting, but then how, how do we understand like the evolutionary 
um, relatedness to us, you know. So this picture you'll see with the CT scans of brains and the picture in the middle is the brain of the uh, Homo floresiensis. Um, the one on the above it, sorry, I had to like get close to my screen. The one above it um, on the top is Homo sapien. The one to the left of it is a Homo sapien with microcephaly. Um, the one on the right is Homo erectus, and then the one be beneath it is um, chimpanzee. So like in the book, it goes into like comparing these and the math involved, but even just like right now in this two dimensional picture with your own eyes, which one does it look more similar to? So hopefully you're noticing it looks most similar to the Homo erectus. And a lot of the research is pointing to this. We know the Homo erectus, you know, moved into different parts of the world, into Asia, eventually died out or so we thought. Well, apparently, you know, some populations of Homo erectus ended up on this island. Island dwarfing happened. They became isolated from everyone else and eventually evolved into Homo floresiensis. So this is like a really interesting story. Um, and like I said, we just, you know, this, this has all been happening over the last like decade, this research. So we always think we know, and then we find out something we're like, oh, this fills in a really interesting piece of the puzzle. So it's interesting. Okay, <clears throat> slide 59, you'll see the Smithsonian recreation of this uh, type specimen. So very interesting, it's a female, okay. Slide 60, one of my favorite stories to tell in paleo. So if we were in class, I would ask you guys, <clears throat> how many of you have watched the show Drunk History? Usually the majority of you say, oh, I've watched it. If, you, if you're watching this, part of this video right now and you've never heard of the show Drunk History, please watch it, it is hilarious. Basically, the premise of the show is these comedians um, get drunk and then they tell um, some kind of interesting uh, historical um, story. So they might have, you know, talk about, you know, a famous um, athlete in time or a famous politician or a famous um, activist or something. And which would be funny enough when people are drunk, you know, but also in this show, they have a reenactment but based on the drunk dialogue of this person telling the story. So it's just, it's hilarious. Anyway, there's, there's a reason why I'm ask, telling you guys about this. So I had a friend tell me recently, this is maybe mm, a little over a year ago. She asked me, have you ever seen Drunk History, the show? And I was like, yes, absolutely, I love it. Um, it's hilarious and I always end up learning something interesting. And she was like, I'm thinking about doing something called Drunk Anthropology. And I was like, I'm in. I'm gonna do it, you know? And so she was like, would you be willing to, I was like, I'd be willing, I will be willing to, to get drunk for science, you know? Um, but anyway, so we had this whole plan. So she looked into what this show actually does and what they end up doing is they give um, the individual like the story that they're gonna tell them, that they're gonna tell. And they tell them, okay, I know when you're drunk, you're obviously not gonna give it all these specific details, but you know, you have to make sure at least we get like the person's name, maybe the date, a couple of locations, and the rest is kind of up to you to tell the story. Um, so I ended up, you know, creating a timeline and some important points of the Piltdown story, which is what I'm going to tell you now. Um, and so I had this like, you know, piece of paper, like, okay, these are the things I'm actually going to talk about. I have to make sure that I talk about at least these, these important names, these important dates. Um, and then apparently on the show, they actually record them doing this, you know, throughout an evening where they're not as drunk to getting drunker and drunker. And then they, you know, edit it together for, you know, like whatever, like the 20 minute episode. Um, so we didn't record ours visually, we just did an audio, audio recording and we're gonna do like an animation with it, but it's, so it's still in the works. But anyway, so I did this and I told the Piltdown hoax story probably about five or six times. I got progressively drunk throughout. Um, I've, I've, I kinda wanna be surprised when she puts it together and I don't really remember telling the last two versions of it at all. Um, and she let me hear about a 30 second snippet and I'll say like, I'm surprisingly articulate when I'm very drunk. Um, and and uh, there was one part I think I'm, I'm talking about the beauty of math or something like I don't know anyway I went off on a tangent anyway but I picked the story because it's like such a good story and it was fun you know telling the story drunk and we'll see how that all turns out um, anyway so this is a story I'm gonna tell you it's a very interesting very interesting story so this is what the last few slides of this PowerPoint are so the Piltdown hoax okay so as you can see here in 1912 um, Charles Dawson found 
some um, bones. This happened in England. And he was like what we would call like an amateur archaeologist. And he found these bones and contacted Arthur Woodward, who worked at the, I'm going to get this wrong, where did he work? Museum of Natural History, I think. I'd have to like double check. So he contacted this, you know, more prominent uh, figure and said, hey, Arthur, I found these bones. I think it might be some kind of human ancestor. I found it in England. And Arthur was like, I got to see this. Now, remember what we talked about before, these preconceptions that people had had about like homo sapien ancestry. And this is early or wrong. We, we, at this point, we have some Neanderthal stuff. Like there are a few specimens. Um, we have you know, like some homo erectus stuff. But a lot of this is being like discounted because we don't have enough to really for people to say, oh, yeah, this is accurate. Like people like Raymond Dart or Eugene Dubois, it's still kind of being disregarded. And um, these 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 uh, scientists have in their mind that you know they're gonna find this stuff in Europe. They're gonna see big brains first. Like they have it all wrong. Um, so, but when 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 Dawson's like, "Hey, I found some stuff in Europe," they're like, "Oh, yes, definitely must be must be uh, part of the human ancestry." And so they believe it right away. Um, and I have some points here on the PowerPoint that the skull um, had a large brain, it had a large mandible, it had ape-like teeth. Because remember, what they thought they would see, because they thought, okay, big brains are the hallmark of humans. In our lineage, it's going to be big, big brains right away. First thing, most important thing. And we're going to be kind of ape-like for the rest of our bodies, and that part's going to change through time. In fact, we know now, because of all the fossil evidence, it's actually the reverse of that. We see bipedalism, upright walking, modern height, and then later we see a big jump in brain size. It was the complete opposite of what they thought they would see. But this, this fossil that they found fit these preconceived notions, so everyone really wanted to believe it. So go to the next slide, slide 61. Um, so I said that here, and that they, they thought they'd see large brain first. They had these very pre preconceived notions of what they would find. Um, um, at this point, they have some Neanderthal stuff and some erectus stuff, but it's still being questioned. Like, it's just really part of the human ancestry. It's not really fitting with our idea. Like, they have so little fossil information at this point, and this this Piltdown specimen really fit their preconceived notions that it was just like, yes, we're definitely going to believe this. Um, but then as, like, new fossils are being found over time, and... We're seeing, you know, all these australopithecines and, uh, you know, Neanderthals as time is going on after Piltdown. Suddenly people start to realize, they're like, wait a second, like we're, we're finding all this stuff. Now we're seeing this bigger picture of what's going on in, in the hominid line, lineage. These fossils before that we kind of discounted, like these Neanderthals and, and uh, Africanus and Erectus, are seeming to kind of fit into this larger story. But now Piltdown is sticking out as not really fitting what is going on. So if you go to slide 62, the last slide, you'll see that like 40 years later, so it was like 1949, 1950, that these researchers were like, you know, maybe we should double check this. Because at, at this point now, they have a lot more fossil information. Like we have way more now. But they used to had, had enough then to where they thought, you know, something's not fitting. Um, Piltdown's not really, it's kind of sticking out. It's not really making sense. And also I should point out that Arthur Woodward had also um, found like another specimen like the next year. He was the only one who ever found anything. Even when he had other people working on the sites, it was always him who found something. And if you actually look into this, you, this would actually be a really good topic for the research paper. There have been so many like conspiracy theories written about like who did what and how. And like, it's really interesting who was involved, you know. Anyway, so these researchers, like like 40 years later, were like, you know, let's actually take the bones and let's do some research on them. Now, at this point, they have a little bit better technology for, like, you know, dating techniques and whatnot. And so they're like, okay, let's actually, you know, do do some tests and, and find out maybe we got it wrong, you know, because obviously what we thought before isn't, isn't correct. And so it didn't take them long, actually not long at all, probably within a few minutes, to, to take these bones out um, because what had happened before was was these bones um, were kind of put away and no one really got a chance, to, no one really at all, except Dawson really, really looked at them. Um, and these researchers in the, in the 1950s were like, wait a second, it was so obvious. They were like, okay, this is part of a human cranium. 
but it's an orangutan mandible that has deliberately been like filed down in certain spots to make it look like it kind of fits with this human cranium. And parts of the bone had been stained with like teeth to make it look older. Some of the teeth had been filed and like there was like literally still glue where it had been glued in. Like no one had even bothered to look. Um, and this speaks to how, like, what were they thinking? Um, that no one verified. It also speaks to like their, their, so their ignorance, but it speaks to like their, these preconceived notions that they had, that they really, really wanted to believe this to be true, that no one bothered to even just look. But it also is a really, this is why I love telling this story. It's a great story to tell about the power of science is that, because we talked about science being repeatable and falsifiable, that these it took a while, but these researchers were like, we need to verify, we need to double check, this isn't fitting with the story, we need to run some tests. And when they did, they were like, okay, obviously this is this is wrong. Not only is it wrong, someone has, has perpetrated a fraud. Now this is where it gets into these, these conspiracy stories. Was it a prank gone wrong? Was it an elaborate, you know, um, 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 conspiracy on, on the part of Charles Dawson to become uh, a prominent, you know, scientist in the field with this amazing discovery? Was he just trying to like, you know, boost his own career? Were, were there more people involved? Um, Cause you, I, I wouldn't, I read into this a little bit. There's a lot of interesting stories like uh, other workers on the site saying, you know, that they were never allowed to um, actually examine the bones. Some reports, even like years later, some of them recounting that they would see, you know, Charles Dawson um, um, it seeming to manipulate the bones. Like how much of this is them saying the story after the fact or not? And it's very interesting. And then there's all these other stories about like what other scientists may have been involved to, um, for whatever their own, you know, their own selfish reasons whatever anyway, anyway like i said a really interesting topic for the research paper if you're interested in this but but i like telling a story because it's just like it's like a conspiracy but also like the like i said the power of science to to come along later and be like look we fixed this now we know and and it's not something we should hide like if you look into any history of, of, of any major science field you're gonna find like that one guy who you know falsified data no one like you're never gonna have a field where every single individual involved in that field is 100% amazing um, super scientist and doesn't have any faults. Like you're always going to have, you know, that one or one or two people throughout the you know, hundreds of years of history of a field who are just, you know, who kind of ruined it for a lot of other people. And in fact, like, because this, this hoax was perpetuated stuff, uh, uh, research that was found right after this, like in the decade um, after this, it was disregarded because people were so convinced that Piltdown was true. Imagine if this hadn't have happened, probably us accepting um, the, the larger hominid story that we know now would have happened much earlier. So it's kind of frustrating, but we, but science is a self-correcting system. This is the whole point of it being, you know, verifiable, uh, falsifiable, you know, repeatable is that it's always working towards the truth. Um, okay. So that's that for the the final part of the genus homo PowerPoint. Um, and I will be posting an update about some other stuff uh, as well on a separate video. So I will hope you guys enjoyed this one and uh, I will talk to you guys later.